Hello and welcome to Build. We're live from London and today we're joined in the studio by Matt Edmondson. Hello, Danny. Hello, everyone. Hi. If you've got a question for Matt, then don't forget you can tweet us at Build Series LDN. That's Build Series LDN. Or if you're watching live on the Facebook video, you can drop a comment in there and we'll do our best to get it to him before the end of the interview. Matt, hello and welcome to Build. Thank you so much for having me here. It's great to have you here. I want to ask you about your new children's book, The Greatest Magician in the World. Well, thank heavens for that, because it's the reason I turned up. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so was it always an ambition of yours to go into children's writing? Because obviously we know you best from TV presenting. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, oh. It's a sort of happy accident uh, that spiralled out of control. So I, I obviously love reading, love books as a kid. Uh, and I was a bit of a bookworm, and I also loved magic, but I never found the magic book that I wanted to read. So when I got into magic, it was after seeing David Blaine on telly, which uh, is still amazing. If you go back and watch that first episode that he put out, incredible stuff. And I watched it and thought, I need to know how he does that. And I, I went to my school library, and they had a magic book, but it was really hard to understand, really difficult to follow. I'd had magic sets previously when I was a kid, and they tend to have like 185 tricks in, of which two are okay, and the rest you have no idea how they work. And I used to find them quite overwhelming. And I, I always grew up thinking I wish there had been a, a book that had magic in it that was really easy to do and gave some context to the tricks, and it doesn't exist. So I thought, oh, I'm going to have to be the person who invents it. So it was a, an idea that, honestly, I've had since the age of about 16, and have been mulling it over. And the thing about the book is that it's a story. So if you want to read just a storybook, hopefully you get a really nice story. Uh, if you love magic, then it has the magic tricks in the book that relate to what's going on in the story that you can pull out and perform. So you can do the tricks uh, that fit into the story as you're reading it. Uh, and all the tricks are made of paper or card, and they're all flat, and they're all different from each other. And they all, as I say, tie into the story. So there was a slight chicken and egg of... Well, I've got a trick that's flat and made of paper, but do I have a beat of my story that works for it? Or I've got a thing that I need to happen in my story. Can I find a trick that serves that bit in the story? So it just took ages, Danny. It took <laughs> ages to put together. And it was a thing that I would, I would do if I had some free time, and I'd you know, oh, love magic, so I was always looking at magic tricks and magic principles and things. And then eventually I made a version of it uh, from a kind of like a photo album. Went to Paper Chase, got some bit, stuck it in, wrote the book, made the tricks out of paper, and then went off and showed it to some people, and they said, oh, we should make this into a proper thing that exists. At that time, it was like, as I said, just a hobby that had spiraled out of control. Yeah. So how long was the process of making it then, from initially starting to put it together yourself in private to literally holding this book in your hands? Oh, mate, a depressingly long time. <laughs> um, I, so I first ever had the idea for it when I was 16, 17. And then that was three, four years ago, right? Exactly, yeah. yes. I'm now uh, 31, Wikipedia age 24. <laughs> um, and Incredible. I, uh, so yeah, I, I had the idea and I started messing around with, well, what flat tricks are there that I can use? But it wasn't until, the thing I always struggled with was, was the story. How do I get it? I didn't want it to just be a book with tricks that you pull out. I wanted it to absolutely have a, a journey that, that we went on. And then that kind of hit me about four years ago. And I made the thing, and then it was two years, because we got a guy, we, we wanted, I really wanted this guy, Gary Parsons, to do the illustrations for the book. He did the Dinosaur That Pooped series. And um, he's, he's brilliant. And actually, I kind of gave them this very raw product, which was the words and the tricks, and he's just brought this back, and it's amazing. It's like what he's done to it, it feels like I'm not even involved in that book anymore. It feels like a, a thing where I can pour over it, and there's so much additional detail he's added to it. So he, he took about a year to do that, and now it's finally out. And I, I, I still, when I see it, I still think, oh, that looks nice. I can't, <laughs> can't quite believe I had anything to do with it. And then your name's on the front, and it's know, like, it's oh, weird. my God. Yeah, there's been such distance between having the idea and it now existing as a real-world thing that uh, it feels like I'm entirely unconnected to it. Well, you mentioned Gary Parsons because the illustrations are, like, a huge part of this book. Like, it's very colourful, it's very interactive. Um, how did you end up collaborating with him? Uh, I think we, we asked him, and he said yes. <laughs> I think uh, he's very in demand. He is a very popular illustrator, um, but... Hopefully, it's quite a compelling idea, and it's something that he hadn't seen before. And I think he liked the idea that he'd be able to not only draw all the characters that Elliot, the lead character, meets along the way, 
and their worlds and that kind of world of magic, but also to draw the props. It's kind of a weird thing to draw something that can be pulled out of a book. Part of the inspiration for this was uh, The Jolly Postman. I don't know if anyone's read that book. I have read The Jolly Postman. It's and that is, well, that's, one, that's what it totally reminded me of because it's got so much that you flick through and you lift up and you pull out. Well, that was very much the inspiration for it. That was my favourite book as a kid, Jolly Postman. Um, if you've not Let read it... Let me just actually open this so we can see. Like, yeah, go on. There's a bit here where there's this box here and you can open this and there's all kinds and of stuff And there's a trick. In, on there's in a trick inside. And you can do that trick if you want. Take, take, right. Don't worry it. about the instructions. Take the trick out. I'll show you how it works. Um, you might have to hold my microphone, Danny, so I can have my hands free. Uh, the role I was born to play. There you go. If you, if you do that, lovely. So tell me which camera can get a close-up of this. Can you get it over there? This over here. here. OK, lovely. Uh, so we have a compass. In fact, I'm going to make it so it points at you. There we go. Uh, so you can see on this side, the hand always points towards you. And at the start of the book, Elliot gets this compass. It, he finds it in a kind of vault that his great-grandfather owned. It's been stashed away for years. And his great-grandfather was the greatest magician in the world. Mm -hmm. And he's left a letter inside that vault saying, whoever finds all this stuff needs to get it into the hands of the greatest magician in the world. Uh, and you do that by following the compass. It leads you to other magicians. So on both sides, there's always a, a hand pointing towards you. Uh, but if you give it to someone that's not a magician... Um, and you snap your fingers in a magic way. The uh, arrow can change direction. So it's now pointing over there on one side, but pointing at you over here. And it can change even more. In fact, I can get it so that it now points over at you guys on one side uh, and over this way there. But it's only the magician that can make it point uh, towards you in the same direction on both sides every single time. So there you go. Oh, my God. My Evans and everyone. And the magic compass. There you go. So that's one of seven tricks that are all... Dead easy to do, and if uh, basically if I, I was to, if you were to read, inst read the instructions, it would say hold it here, and it will always be the same size, uh, same point, in the same direction. Hold it on any of the other ones. There's a secret dot there. Hold it on any of the other ones, and it'll change direction. So everything is so simple to get your head round, and obviously it has instructions inside as well, which are there. Don't lose those. You'll need them when you're practicing for Christmas Day. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also some videos online of me explaining how to do any of the tricks. Amazing. Well, you mentioned your own interest in magic. Mm. And you're actually a member of the Magic Circle, is that I correct? I am, yes. Which, for those true. who don't know, it's the organization of all magicians and keeping each other's tricks secret, right? Yeah, so we sort of get together and we share tricks with each other, but we don't, you know, if you're a magician, you try not to explain how tricks are done. So we'll, we'll ignore what just went down there. Yeah, unless they're That's in this book, us. in which case it's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, the Magic Circle kind of has a reputation for being quite intense and people being shunned from it if they do spill secrets. Is that reputation correct? Um, I don't know if intense is the right word. It's, uh, it's, very, it's a very friendly organisation. But um, I think if people do go out of their way to reveal secrets which are closely guarded magic secrets or things that people are using professionally. So if you're a working magician and there's a thing that you do to achieve your magic effect mm -hmm. and then someone goes and puts that on telly, that isn't ideal. And so, yeah, you might get a, a kind of rap over the knuckles for that. And people have been thrown out. But you know what? Some of those people who have been thrown out have been welcomed back in many years later. Oh, that's nice. So it's not a total door in the face. Uh, for some people, I think it has been. But uh, for, for most people, it's all right. And the thing is, most magicians don't want people to know how their tricks work yeah. because as, what's the point of doing it? Um, although there has to be a part of magic which is open to the general public. So things like magic sets, things like this book, things like if you look up magic tricks on YouTube or everyone's got an uncle that can do a card trick and you kind of need someone to teach you those first few things before you delve into the dark web of magic. <laughs> There isn't such a thing, but uh, until you, you know, go for, the, go for the, hard, the hardcore magic stuff. Okay, well, I can't be the first person to point this out, but um, I don't know if you can see Elliot there on the front cover of the book. He does look a little bit familiar. Yes. He does look slightly like you. Yeah, he does a bit, doesn't he? I, Was that intentional? It, not at all. Um, I, I wrote a character called Elliot. I didn't describe what he looked like. Uh, so Gary went and did the illustrations. But um, I, he does, yes, he does look a bit like me. Also, that there's a picture of my... Elliot has a dog, and it is my dog uh, in the book, which I'm delighted about. And I wish that the dog could understand that he's in a book. But <laughs> sadly, he's now got a newfound celebrity status. Sadly, he's a dog and doesn't know. But I'm very delighted that he's in there. Uh, so, yes, he does, he does look a little bit like me. I mean, I almost dressed exactly like him today. Was that on purpose as well? Yes. Were you yes, basically that's just wanting I'm people now, to make the comparison? I'm now in character as Elliot. Um, obviously, you're now a proud father as well. Yes. Was having a baby... Well, you've assumed proud, but yes. <laughs> 
actually deeply ashamed. No, of course <laughs> not. Um, is the, was that something that inspired you to kind of want, like, want to get into children's writing and entertainment in general, I guess? Well, no. So the, the, uh, the book, I, the idea of the book came, as I said, years and years ago. Uh, and it just sort of coincided with me becoming a dad later on. Um, so, so my daughter's only one year old and uh, she is yet... To um, to learn any magic tricks, which is deeply disappointing. But um, <laughs> but at some point, I'm very excited about being that slightly annoying dad that teaches her tricks. And when her friends come around, I'm like, let me show you my room of magic, which is my downstairs toilet. <laughs> wow. But yeah, that's the sort of thing that for the first five, six years is going to be the coolest thing in the world. Exactly. And then, and then I'm going to become the most embarrassing father that's ever lived. And you know what? Bring it on. How, in general, has uh, becoming a dad changed like your life and your career? Has it changed your like perspective or anything? No, um, I think I, I, before I became a dad, you hear lots of people say, "Ah, oh, I got this immediate feeling that like my my purpose in life had changed, and I had a new perspective on life, and I suddenly felt responsible." I just felt exactly the same. <laughs> I felt exactly the same. I was like, I've got this cool little person knocking around now. That's fine. My life really has not changed that much. It's been pretty similar. <laughs> I guess that's what you want, though. Like, I feel like if you were to have a sudden realization, it might inspire some sort of panic or something. So the yeah, fact that it's I, not... There, there wasn't any panic, particularly. It's such a gradual thing, isn't it, time, that it's, uh, you kind of just get used to it. You know, you, 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 obviously you have an intense feeling of love for this being that never existed before and now does exist. But in terms of the day-to-day -day practicalities of life, I liked an early night before. I like an early night now. It's fine. She's very lucky. She's been sleeping, sleeping through all the way. I think I'm getting more sleep now that I've had a baby than before I had a baby, which I is think you're the first person to I ever know, say I know, that. I know. I know. It's, it's deeply offensive to other parents. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure so it sorry. is. Um, right, let's go back to the beginning of your presenting career. Um, people first got to know you really through doing videos on Holy Moly, the gossip website, if we remember that, remember yes, those days. Yes. They were known for being quite like irreverent and quite like silly. Was that sense of humor always welcomed by the people you were interviewing? Um, I would say mostly yes. Yeah, generally it was fine. Um, I think, I think whenever I've gone in to interview someone, I always make sure that I that my, my status in the interview is pretty low. Uh, so I, um, I make sure that I uh, am taking the mickey out of myself as much as I am out of them. And I'm willing to offer up enough for myself to hopefully them to join me on that journey. Yeah. Um, sometimes you get people who are a bit confused by it. Um, but generally, people have been absolutely fine. I've never had any storm outs, and I'm really glad because I... Oh, actually, I had one once. It wasn't for Holy Moly, for another thing, where someone tried to punch me during an interview, which Who wasn't ideal. Who tried to ideal. punch you? It was a guy from a band called The Twang, um, who were a, a band from Manchester, and we were... To be fair, we were doing a feature for a T4 show that I used to do, um, and the feature was called Quiz In My Pants, and mm -hmm. I would do an interview, and then I would strip down to my underwear and do a quiz. And um, he had been briefed, and in the interview... Briefed? Pun good. the pun. An accidental pun. Accidental pun. Sorry about that. I wish I'd got to that myself as a real <laughs> thing. I love it when the universe delivers one like that. Um, so I, I was doing an interview, and he just got very upset about the fact that, that we weren't talking about how intense it was for them to make their album or something like yeah. that. I was asking slightly sillier questions. So he, there, he tried to storm out the interview and he got coaxed back by the, the pl uh, plugger or whoever it was from the record label. Came back and then he kind of refused, there were two of them and he refused to answer any questions. And you've got two options there. One is to go, okay, I understand that this is, he doesn't want to answer any questions. I'm going to ask them to the other guy. Or you make the whole interview about the fact that one guy won't speak to you. And I will always choose option B. Well, especially when you're already stood there in your pants. Like... Well, I wasn't in my pants at this point. Oh, yet. okay. This was just a chat. Oh, okay. So I, so I just would not let him not answer questions because it annoyed. I thought it was rude that he would storm off and then come back over something so so petty. Then I got into my underwear. Then he tried to punch me, and a producer leapt like Batman in front of in, intercepted the punch and had to drag him to the other side of the room. Bear in mind, I was in my underwear. I had to go to the other side of the room as well. It was. Um, it was very odd. And I had that feeling of, you know, when you're at school and someone says, I'm going to get you tomorrow. I had that feeling of like, oh, no. <laughs> my heart was kind of beating. I had adrenaline going. I was in my underwear. It was, um, it was awful. 
And obviously the twang got so successful as well. You must be worried every time you leave the house, every time you go to an event that they're still going to well, be there. Well, listen, I hope they've mellowed. I hope they've mellowed since then. But it, yeah, it was a very aggy uh, response to, I think, I think the question that, r that kicked it off was, what's your favourite hot beverage? And he went, I don't know. And I was like, you must know. You're you. You must know. <laughs> Either you don't like any, or you have one that you prefer. You can't say I don't know to that. And he was like, I don't know. I was like, well, mine's hot chocolate. He was like, all right, that then. I was like, you can't just nick my one. Have your own one. And then, then he got up and stormed and then, out. Yeah. Who knew hot beverages would lead to such controversy? I know, exactly. <laughs> Although, don't ask me that question, because I will, I will go. I've actually, yeah, I've got that further down. <laughs> so I'll, that one's officially scrapped. Um, on the other side of things, who's been the people that you've been pleasantly surprised by? Um, there are some people that, uh, that I've interviewed that I just... I suddenly, sometimes you meet people and you think, we should be friends in real life. Like, we should be friends. Daniel Radcliffe is one of those people. So uh, I met him, and I was just like, Daniel, we've got so much in common. I don't, this is in my own head, not out loud. Um, <laughs> we, should, we should be friends. Anyway, he, at the end of the interview, said, I'm doing this play, The Cripple of Inishman, in town. You should come and watch it. I was like, oh, yeah, great. So I went to watch the play, and then he said, oh, you should come backstage after. And I went backstage, and... His backstage area, his dressing room, was full of board games and quiz books. And I was like, oh, I love a board game. <laughs> I love a quiz. Daniel Radcliffe and I should be really, really good friends. So I, um, I've invented a couple of board games, and I knew he was coming into Radio 1, so I gave him one of my board games. And inside I wrote a note saying, let me know what you think of it, and left my email address. He never emailed. Oh, my God. It's really sad, right? Oh, I was hoping that would have a happy no, ending. No, sadly not. No, it now has an awkward ending, because the next time I see him, I'm going to have to pretend... We're both going to have to pretend that didn't happen. Um, uh, pleasantly surprised as well, Hugh Jackman, absolute legend. Well, lovely I think everybody man. thinks he's really lovely, though. Was he, was he as lovely as you were hoping? He was the definition of charming. He, so I used to do T4, and it was filmed in the top floor of a shopping centre in uh, West London, the Queensway Centre. Non-stop glamour. Oh, my God. I don't know what's going on with that, but I think they're turning it into flats now, and I'm not surprised because there was no footfall in that shopping centre for three years. I don't know what was going on there, but it was, seemed shady. Anyway, uh, Hugh Jackman arrived uh, through the shopping centre. He, he turned up without any managers or agents or PR people to promote a film he was doing on a Brompton foldable bike, like the ones from W1A, um, that he had borrowed from a hotel porter. He then cycles to T4. He got the, like, the address of where it was. He'd gone up through the Queensway Centre, past like, you know, Bella Italia and the body shop, um, come up to the main reception where they do like the right stuff and other things, and said, hello, my name's Hugh Jackman. I'm here for T4. And the receptionist was like, oh, my God, this is insane. <laughs> uh, and uh, they went and they, they popped, popped him in a dressing room. And he came in, he said hello to everyone in the room, all the camera people, the uh, kind of floor managers, everyone. And uh, then did an absolutely adorable interview. And then at the end went, and I'm sure he does this to everyone, but he was like, great interview, mate. Really good job. Oh, my God. And I was like, oh, Hugh, stop it. I would literally swoon. And, uh, and then he got on his little bike and cycled off again. And, and I just thought, went. that's the way to be internationally famous. So you've been doing this for a long time now. Do you still get starstruck? No, and I never, I've never gotten starstruck. I remember, I remember the only time I get starstruck is when I see famous people totally out of context. Mm -hmm. So if I see someone in the street, I'm like, oh my God, it's Louis Theroux in the street. That's exciting. But if you know you're going to see them, so if I know I'm going to interview someone for a movie or whatever, I just have this resounding feeling that they're a human being and that all of the things that you, all of the worries you probably have about it, they also have about it as well, because they're there to do what they're there to do. They're just a human being, it's fine. And I sort of can't escape that feeling of like, oh, we're just two human beings. So, um, so no, I never get starstruck, unless they're out of context. If I see someone in the street, I'm like, oh, is that person over there? I, I get like the most starstruck by like the least famous people. So I could meet someone like, amazingly alias and just be like, yeah, that's fine. We're both human beings. But I see someone who like finished sixth in the X Factor seven years ago and I'm like, oh my it's God. It's Austin Drage. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, like, literally I'm yeah. like, oh my God. I remember you from three weeks of TV 10 years ago. Yeah. Speaking of the X Factor, actually, that was a very clumsy name drop, but you... That was a sweet segue. If you I, mean, I, listen, I, I if wish that it was. I wish it was deliberate. It. Yeah. But um, you obviously presented the Extra Factor last year. That was Indeed one of I your did. biggest high-profile gigs. Have you been watching the series this year? Do you know what? I haven't, and that's really bad, isn't it? Um, but my excuse is that I've been away for all of it. I've been in Lithuania. Don't get jealous, guys. Um, 
for for about a month filming a show called Release the Hounds, and it was when the X Factor launched. So uh, I have yeah, I haven't seen any of it. But should I catch up? Is it good this year? Well, uh, <laughs> how should I? How should I put, I've read mixed things. Mixed things, okay. Uh, I mean, the X Factor always gets mixed things. What it obviously is lacking is me and Rylan mucking about afterwards. Quite obviously. Yeah, that's, um, that, that would boost the ratings by three, four viewers. I did want to ask you about that because you've been a fan of The X Factor for a long time. Yeah. And obviously, you owe quite a lot of your career to The X Factor. Yeah. What do you think of... There's a lot of talk about whether it should be cancelled, whether, you know, like it's got its lowest ever viewing figures, whether it's time to just pull the plug. What do you think of that? I think I'm probably unqualified to answer that question because I don't know enough about it. Um, what I do know is that I like it, and I think there's always a place on telly for a good singing format. And I think it's had peaks and troughs. There have been years where it's gone down, there have been years where it's been the biggest thing on TV. Uh, I still think, despite the fact that I haven't watched any of it, that it is incredibly watchable. Um, so, yeah, I, I, and also it's, it feels like a bit of the furniture, doesn't it? It feels like a, a part of the TV landscape that would be sad to say goodbye to. But I think it is hard, I think, like, you know, big... I think, I, I think big Saturday night telly is a really hard thing to, to nail and to get right. And obviously Strictly's doing really well. But it Strictly has that thing of being a live event from the very first episode. Yes. And The X Factor doesn't. It, it, you can catch up on The X Factor. But when The X Factor goes live, I think, hopefully, that's when it becomes a kind of national can't-miss talking point. But until then, you can miss it because you can watch it on catch-up. So you reckon it's not quite too late for it, then? Uh, I don't... I don't know. Uh, well, I know it's not because I know they've got another year. Well, they're coming, definitely coming back for one more year contractually. That I do know. After then, who knows? Who knows? You know, it's telly. Who knows? Any, literally anything could happen. OK, well, obviously, you've got this new book out. You've got the presenting career behind you. And also, you're now doing a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff, as well as Obama Llama and all the fabulous games. Yeah. What is left on your to-do list? Oh, I don't know. A little holiday would be nice. Nice. Um, what's left? Uh, I don't know, really. I... When I started off my career, all I wanted to do was work in telly. And I didn't mind whether it was as a presenter or as someone behind the scenes or whatever. I just loved television. It was a thing I thought about all the time. And I never thought I would find anything that I liked as much as telly and that would make me think about it as often as telly did. Then I found radio. And I was like, ah, oh, this feels a bit like how I feel about telly. And I thought, well, there can't be anything else. Then I found board games. And I was like, oh, man. As one does. Exactly. Uh, I love it. So now I've... And it's like anything. If you do it once, you want to keep doing it. You present a TV show, you want to present another TV show. You do some radio, you want to do more radio. You invent a board game, you think, well, if I've done it once, I can do it again. So I'm going to do... I'm going to have some more board games out next year. Um, and I'm writing the second one of these at the moment. Is that going to be a follow-up or is it going to be a whole new story? It's going to be... Well, it's going to be a, fo a follow-up, obviously a new story with the same character. And it's going to have... Same look-alike character, specifically. Exactly, yes. Yeah. He'll have aged. Um, uh, and it'll have tricks in. So I'm at the point now where I'm trying to... I'm at that chicken and egg scenario now where I'm trying to work out what's the story and how on earth do I get the tricks to weave into it. But I think I'm almost there. I think I've almost cracked it. I hope right. so. I've got to write it by Christmas. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Not long, then. Um, we're going to throw over to the audience in just a second, but we've had a question on Twitter. Someone's asking, do you ever feel guilty on Release the Hounds when the celebrities are being chased? Nah. <laughs> nah. Uh, it's, my, it's my first series of doing it this year. So Reggie's done it in the, in the past few years, but he's off making documentaries now. So they asked me to come and do it, and I love the show as a viewer. And I, I thought, when you watch it, you think... If, if you haven't seen the show, by the way, it's, a, it's like a game show, a bit like The Crystal Maze, but horror-themed. Um, so everything's designed to scare you. And you, the thing you're winning isn't points, it's distance away from a pack of wild hounds. And you run from them. And if they catch you, that's it. They, they take you down like, like you would... You ever seen like a dr sniffer dog or something? What does happen if they catch you? Is that literally just... Boom! On the face in the mud. You get dogs all over you. Yeah. It's, it's terrifying to watch. So I'd assumed that on the telly, I was like, oh, they must like put in a stunt person or it's a cutaway or something. There's some way that these people aren't actually doing it. No, it's totally real. They get there, they run from dogs. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that the show has been made. Um, but, uh, but my God, it's fun. 
it's it's a really really fun thing to to watch. And no, I don't feel too too bad. So some of the really nice contestants, they're all celebrities. They're yeah. playing for charity, so you know they they know what they're doing there. Um, some of the really nice contestants, you think, oh, I feel a bit sad. Or you, you, there are people that have done really well in the games that you think, I want you to do it. But also, and I'm not going to name names, but there are some people on it who are genuinely awful. Oh, and please do name names, though. The Real Housewives of Cheshire. Oh! Um, and you think, I kind of don't mind if a, I don't mind if a dog takes you down, <laughs> Dawn Ward. Um, so, um, so, yeah, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. Okay. Yeah. What, what's going on with these Real Housewives of Cheshire? Uh, well, well, they're on the show. They didn't know what the show was. So they, they, they sort of turned up and they were like, what's, what's, what's going on? I was like, well, it's released the hounds. They're like, what? So is it like fox hunting? I was like, well, no. Well, in a way, yes, you're the fox. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they tried to buy their way out of, the, out of the show. They offered to just give the money to charity from their own pockets. And uh, they were very non-compliant with all of the games. I'm sure it won't come across in the edit. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's something I really can't wait to watch. Yeah. Nor can I. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Very intrigued to see how they put it all together. And do, do they get taken down in the end, or are you not allowed you to tell us? You'll have to wait and see. Okay, yeah. well, what a cliffhanger. There you go. Um, let's throw this over to the audience. So who is up first? Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, your new book is about a magician. Um, if you could have one magic power, what would you choose? Oh, I'd, I'd, like, um, I'd quite like to have uh, the ability to control people's minds. Uh, that would be quite good. So I could say, Danny, get me a cup of tea. And Danny would just sort of walk off and get a cup of tea. Um, although I do, I do worry that I would use that for evil. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I think we, there's a mind reader in this book, and I sort of wish that I could read minds for real. If you get the book, it, it looks like you can. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd quite like, uh, on very select opportunities, to read people's thoughts. I wouldn't want it all the time. Um, read people's thoughts or control their thoughts would be good. Yeah, I, that's the last thing that I would want. I would just hate to be on the tube and just be minding my own business and just hear everyone thinking, what's he wearing? Why is he yeah. standing Why there? Why has he done that with his hair? Yeah, exactly. I just, I couldn't stand it. I'd be in bits all the time. Well, here's a, here's a thing, right? And this is a bit of empowerment for you, everybody. Um, I always think, whenever you think someone's thinking something about you, they're not. <laughs> they don't care. Like, it's a lovely thing to realize. Like, most people, almost everyone doesn't care about you. Not you specifically, Danny. Uh, I was going to say, that's, <laughs> that's great. I, you're right, that's dead empowering. I feel great about myself but right now. But if you now. just think, like, do you, do you sit there and look at everyone and think, oh, I've got, I'm having bad thoughts about all these people? No. Yeah, you, mostly. Do you no, really? I'm just, <laughs> so, I, I'm just normally occupied with, like, I just never really think that much about what other, you know, I, I never sit and criticise people in my head all the time. So people probably aren't doing it to you. And even if they are, it doesn't matter, because you'll never know. Yeah. Well, hopefully not, provided I don't somehow get mind powers. Exactly. If you get the mind powers, then it, that could backfire. I right. would never leave the house, yeah. I swear yeah. to God. Uh, who is up next in the audience? Hello. Hi. Hi. If you could choose a song as your theme tune, what would it be and why? Oh, a song as my theme tune. That's really challenging. Um, what do I go for? So I occasionally go out and DJ for freshers, and I ironically play the Rocky intro music uh, to, uh, to, to come onto stage with, and then immediately undercut it by saying, hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> Uh, so let's go with that. Let's go big. Let's go the Rocky theme tune. Why not? What do you play for the freshers? Like, what's guaranteed to get freshers going? Oh, at the moment, everyone... I always... Uh, I have a slight kind of finger hover over, is Despacito going to clear the dance floor or is it going to be the best song of the night? And so far, it's been the best song of the night. People love Despacito. I feel like if you play that at 9.30, then everyone thinks they're too cool for yeah. it. But a few Jigger bombs down, everyone is in the middle. People absolutely love it. Um, what else? All the kind of all the like ones you'd expect. Ed Sheeran, Shape of You. People go absolutely nuts for that at the moment. Um, I like to weave in a few odd curveball tracks, uh, but generally for a freshers gig, it's like what's popular now. Play that. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, who is up next? Hi, I just wanted to ask you. Since you've done a lot of live television, what's been your most embarrassing on-air moment? Oh, um, do you know what? When I've been live, I've never had anything terrible happen. And in a way, the, way, the bits where it goes wrong are the bits that I love the most. I absolutely love a tape not playing or whatever, because it's sort of, it's like, it, it gives you that buzz of, oh, I'm actually doing the thing that I'm meant to be doing here. I'm, 
holding a show together that's falling apart. Um, there have not been that many when I've been live. I mean, when Hugh Jackman came in, actually, we, we did, he was promoting uh, a movie called Real Steel, which was about robots fighting, like Robot Wars, but better than Robot Wars. Um, big. And uh, we, we got some robots in and got him to, like, have a battle with them. Uh, and one of the robots had blue bubbles. So he had this one that was, like, incredible and had razor blades and all the rest of it. And my one, the joke was it would come out and it would have bubbles and it would look rubbish. But it had to be filled up with fairy liquid. And uh, he went over and, as part of the sketch, kicked it over, which then sent a pool of fairy liquid onto the floor, which he then slipped in, in, like, the most Home Alone baddie on a slippy floor way imaginable. You know, like, sometimes in life, things happen in slow motion. It was one of those where he just went womph up, and he the curve with which he fell was... Uh, it was like a reverse belly flop. It was just straight onto his back with an almighty thud, and it was on a TV studio floor, which is, like, glossy, hard concrete, mm -hmm. and he just went down. And I honestly, in the moment, thought, oh, my God, we've killed, we've killed Hugh Jackman. We've killed Hugh Jackman. Yeah. That's awful. Or we've, like, paralysed him, or, like, he's not insured for this. What, what are we going to do? How is he going to get back to the hotel on that Brompton. Um, and he uh, thankfully was all right, and he took it really well. He had to do that kind of um, thing of <laughs> pretending that he wasn't hurt, but was clearly in agony. Where clearly he was like, had tears I'm, in fine, his eyes. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Yeah, it was, it was, that, was, that was pretty bad. That was pretty bad. I also once interviewed Dynamo with uh, my friend Will Best on T4. And Will, whenever Will and I presented together, we were basically deeply unprofessional because I would try and make him laugh all the time and he would try and make me laugh. And we were very successful at making each other laugh. And we had this interview with Dynamo. And I think that it, maybe it's still on YouTube. They put, um, they put all the outtakes of us trying to interview poor, poor Dynamo, who I love, of course, because of magic. Um, and we just can't get through the interview. We're both making each other laugh too much. And it was so embarrassing. It's mortifying. The thing is, when... he's like terribly serious as well and, as me. And boy, was he. Yeah. And we were, we were we, it, like tears streaming down our faces. And I had a producer in my ear going, you need to, you need to stop laughing now, which just makes it funnier. Yeah. Um, it was really, it was really bad. So that was deeply unprofessional. Thankfully, it wasn't live. So they were able to chop all of that out and put it as its own separate YouTube video, which shames us. Did you at the end have to say like, sorry about that unfortunate laughing in your face? Not even at the end, position. like during the interview. And Dynamo didn't know what was funny because there wasn't anything that was yeah. funny other than we just made each other giggle. So that's the worst thing. He handled it brilliantly. Can't fault Dynamo, how Dynamo handled it, which was just to like sit there and go, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let this die down and then we'll actually have an interview. Um, but yes, during the interview I was saying, it was lots of me going, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about this. I'm so sorry. Will, we need to stop. I'm so sorry. Trying to ask the next question and then immediately laughing again. It was awful. Did part of you not wonder if the laughter was actually part of Dynamo's mind control at but any point? Quite possibly. Quite possibly, yeah. I think if I was him, I would definitely have taken credit for that, right? Mm, exactly, yes. Yeah. He, can, he can produce laughing gas. Uh, he's, uh, yeah, no, he, I think he was just a bit nonplussed by the whole thing. Mm hmm all right, Matt, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. But give it up one more time for Matt Edmonton, everyone. Thanks for having me.